Um, so I'm Caitlin Childs. I work at Social Advocates for Youth, and we are a nonprofit organization here in Sonoma County. Is this echoey or? No. Okay. It's exactly. echoing for me. So. <laughs> um, so we do three things, housing, counseling, and jobs. And we work with about 4,600 young people last year here in Sonoma. And our office is based in Santa Rosa, and it's the SAY Finley Dream Center. And it's our brand new campus. And if any of you are interested in coming to see it, I really invite you to come take a tour with us. Uh, personally, I've worked at Social Advocates for Youth for almost seven years, and I'm our communications and marketing manager, so I get to do all the fun stuff, our graphic design, our marketing, our photography, our website, um, all the creative stuff, and I get to tell stories, and, um, and I get to meet our young people and tell their stories, which is the best part of any job. And our young people are coming from a lot of different backgrounds, but all of them are facing some sort of challenge. And in Sonoma County right now, I know everybody has heard so much about housing and how hard it is to find. And housing is particularly hard to find for young people who are living on their own. So that's why the first thing we do is housing. We help young people who are homeless or who are at risk of becoming homeless find housing. And our Dream Center campus is a uh, brand new purpose-built space. We transformed Warwick Hospital, which had been sitting empty for the last six or seven years, into a new affordable housing program. So we built, um, we, it was a 69-bed hospital, and um, in the next four years, we're gonna be expanding up to 63 young people being able to find housing on site with us. And our Dream Center is kind of the perfect example of how to fuse art and youth and you know like building a future too because we knew building that space we needed a lot of money we raised 9.8 million dollars in 16 months from donors here in sonoma county uh, it's almost entirely local businesses and individuals and foundations we had no government funding for, for that piece of the campaign and what we did was we took the space, worked with an architect, worked with um, young people, and walked them through before we even talked about what to do, and had them come look at it, and had them kind of put a stamp on, uh, on that space. They helped us with a, a really cool art installation in our main entry courtyard, um, that when you see it's got a mosaics with words, and one of the words is inspire, and one of the words is independence, and the last phrase is dare to win. And we ask those young people to give the gift of words to the future youth who are going to be using that space. And those are some of the words they came up with. So if you come to visit us, please check that out. Great. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you, Caitlin. Um, one thing that uh, I did want to add just to Caitlin's um, story about social advocates for youth is, and um, what Suzanne was sharing today, is that the goal for today is, by the way, um, I'm really loud, and nobody has ever asked me to have a mic. So <laughs> if I am like blowing people out of here, let me know, and I can just take this off. Um, but one of the goals for today's uh, event is to have 20% of today's proceeds go to um, SAY, Social Advocates for Youth. And there is an iPad set up um, at the, by the membership table. And you can just swipe if you care to make any type of donation in addition to whatever you may have paid to you know, get the entrance you know, past to today's door. Um, everything's going to go to SAY. So just wanted to throw that out there, and it would be a wonderful cause. Um, just to give a little bit of a... Um, intro to the other panelists. Um, we've got Caitlin on the end. And then, yes, Michael uh, McGinnis. Michael uh, spent his life doing a variety of things, many of which center on 3D art and young people. Um, since completing his master's in sculpture at University of Kansas, Mike has become a dedicated professor at Santa Rosa Junior College, where he has taught since 1987. He currently teaches computer graphics, 3D design, and sculpture and is loved by his students. He is also responsible for creating most of the interactive display 
displays at the Children's Museum of Sonoma County. So welcome, Michael McGinnis. <laughs> Michelle Carnes is um, an artist with fine art works. Michelle's art career has spanned more than two decades. She has been a guest on NBC News, interviews, uh, interviewed on KUVO Jazz Radio, and has won the 2007 Southwest Art Magazine Plein Air Jurors Pick Award. She was awarded um, and recognized for her 2011 Burning Man Rites of Passage, which I would love to hear more about, um, <laughs> multifaceted art installation, which also was featured in the Black Rock City Magazine. Uh, her one-woman shows, Heart and Soul of Denver, and Celebrations were both sold-out shows. She created the live painting feature in Serre la Muse Cabaret, which was recognized in the Press Democrat, and the North Bay Bohemian. She was the creator and former owner of Counterculture Art House Gallery in Sebastopol, California, and has sold her original works in galleries in Chicago, Denver, and the San Francisco Bay Area as well as in private international collections. Uh, her original works and live painting shows have transformed spaces in public venues, uh, including 2013 Sundance Film Festival, 2013 South by Southwest, the intersection of Google and entertainment venues in the Bay Area. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, she also transforms space by creating art that is unique to each client and enriches that space through artful design. So welcome, Michelle Carnes. And last but not least, oh God, please let me get the name right, uh, Gordon Huther. Close enough. Huther. Okay. <laughs> um, artist with Gordon Huther Studios. Uh, Gordon Huther learned art composition and appreciation at an early age uh, from his father. In the course of his initial artistic explorations, Huther was resolved to create a lasting impact on the world around him through the creation of large scale site-specific works of art and founded his studio in Napa, California in 1987. Huther's portfolio is comprised of more than 75 public art and 180 private commission installations, as well as small, smaller, more intimate fine art. The architectural work is not about Gordon as an artist, but about the space and the people who use that space and creating a visual dialogue between the art and culture, cultural architecture of the site. Gordon brings his perspective of creating a successful art career from scratch to our panel. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen either of these artists' works, but wow, I Googled them this morning uh, just to prepare a little bit, and I was really blown away. So I think we've got, you've got your kind of portfolios and, and cell oh, sheets and stuff. <laughs> so here we go. Yeah, so hi, everybody. Am I on? No. Yep. It's a green light, though. Oh, do I need to be off? Well, I'll just do it like this. So back on that table, that's all right. Back on that table, um, my partner Darcy Sue and I. Darcy, put your hand up, please. Thank you. It's my partner right there. She brought along some um, promotional materials. That's what you call them, I guess. So whatever. But you're welcome to um, take that with you or um, check us out on the website. Fantastic. The only other thing that I'd like to add is that if I seem like I'm pushing things along today, uh, Caitlin has to leave promptly at 3.30, so I don't want to like blah, 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 be railroading everything, but we're kind of steering a 3.30 deadline. Um, so we'll, we've got four wonderful questions. Um, we will uh, have a 10-minute discussion kind of amongst the panelists on the, on the questions and then at, wrap up with a QA, and a and um, then afterwards go on another tour of the facility. Um, so the first question, I'd like to kind of um, start out directing towards Gordon and, and then kind of expand. I'm sorry, I think I want to be standing over here so that I can see. Yeah, I have to keep this. looking over there. Yeah. Get the, um, keep my neck. So how does art exposure, how does exposure to art during teen and preteen years affect early adult life choices? Uh, start with Gordon and then kind of open up. For I think more. there's only one mic that's happening here, so that how's that? Up. That's working. Okay, just... <clears throat> Let's say the question again so we all hear it and not hear it because there's... How does the, exposure to art during teen and preteen years affect early adult life choices? Well, I guess that would depend on who the child is. Um, I can really only mostly speak for myself um, with my own background and then maybe apply it to things that I've been doing since. But um, for me, I knew that 
maybe when I was five years old, I was already freaking out what I was going to do when I grew up. And I decided that I had the heart and soul of an artist, and that's, that was just it. And then a few months or a few years later, I thought about it some more, and I realized that I didn't have any talent, so I thought God was playing a cruel trick on me. <laughs> and what the issue was is, well, I was judging talent by my father's standards, and he was kind of a Renaissance man. He believed the world had been cultural decline since the Renaissance. And so, you know, I can't draw. I'm not even interested in that, and I can't paint. Um, but um, so I thought if I worked harder than everybody else, and it might take me longer than everybody else, but maybe I could earn that talent over time. And so I basically dedicated the past 40 years um, to trying to do large scale work all over the world that has a lasting positive impact on people. And I think that um, really the thing here is about kids at risk. And so I just have to tell you from my own personal experiences, well, I am one of those kids at risk. So I grew up in an immigrant family, broken home, lots of violence, lots of racial tension, just the whole schmear, inner city, all of that, which um, the highlight was being in maximum security juvenile hall for like three months. All right, so um, fear, I think, is a great motivator. Really, the fear of failure, the, the fear of just dying. When you go to school with kids that are dead in trunks of cars or whatnot, it gives you a different perspective. So, but not all of us are able to leverage that um, to um, make something out of your life. So I've been able to take those experiences, and I did leverage that, and we are doing stuff all over the United States, different parts of the world, huge projects. And um, we have, uh, I have spent a lot of time with kids at, at risk, with mentoring and um, helping where I can. And it's not really to me about the art part. Yeah, that can, that can help them, the exposure, but that doesn't mean everybody needs to be an artist. That's not the point. The point is there's a way out that you have to kind of be able to um, have a certain vision for yourself and know who you are. Michelle, how did um, any uh, exposure to art and so forth in your teens or whatever guide you into? Um, yes, hello, I'm Michelle. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm hoping I'm not echoing too much. No, <laughs> it's only the speaker that's echoing in here. Okay. Um, yeah, like Gordon said, I also um, had, I was a, at risk teen. I grew up in Chicago in the inner city and I'm from immigrant parents as well. I'm Ukrainian and I grew up in Ukrainian Catholic um, neighborhood in Chicago called Ukrainian Village and uh, English wasn't our first language when we were growing up and I think that I, I always knew I was um, an artist as long as I can remember. I enjoyed playing with pencil and typing paper more than toys or um, and I always wanted to do that. Um, how I think uh, it really helps youth at risk is that it helps us, creativity, exploring our creativity and exploring our voice helps us find human connection. It helps us express um, feelings that maybe we are too embarrassed or too afraid to express. And whether it be through art, painting, dance, music, spoken word, I believe that um, it's um, vital for children, all children, especially children at risk, to be able to have that outlet. Um, it saved my life and it um, has given me the most abundance and joy I can ever imagine. So, uh, Caitlin, I just, uh, not, not to skip over you, Michael, but I'm just curious, um, with, at SAY, um, do you see at all like any of your um, art programs or if you have, you know, anything like that, that it does kind of guide them and, you know, help people or does it affect their choices or life choices? Yeah, um, for us we do counseling and we have an art therapy room in our counseling building and we have young people who it's really their only way to express themselves. So we work with kids as young as five all the way up to 25 in our counseling programs and we see that you know some kids come in and they don't have words to verbalize what's going on in their heads but they can draw something or they can sculpt something or they can make a mask that shows what is happening for them and that exposure is huge like that that ability to express themselves and then have somebody interpret it accurately is the other piece of it because 
in counseling, kids are telling you what's happening, um, and it takes a therapist to listen the right way. So um, the therapists we have who are trained in doing art therapy are really good at kind of picking out, like, what does that mean when you make something? Right on. Uh, Michael, um, how do other forms, well, I, I'm asking Michael this question because just his, you know, the brief bio that I got on him, it's like, you know, he's, he's he, to me, you're like the, the philosopher, like the, the, the consonant, you know, yearning to learn. Um, so I just want to get your take on how do other forms of art, be it music, theater, and writing, um, challenge your views on the visual arts? Sure. Um, well, I did want to add a little bit to what other people were talking about, too. Uh, I come from a family of 12 kids, and um, we never had anything new. We never had any kind of uh, real art supplies or any, any carts, go-karts, or anything like that. So what we ended up doing was just making everything. And I think uh, it's a desire, like you were mentioning, that people need to have some method of communicating, method of communicating their emotions or their feelings and what art can do, what art is, is able to do that, say, science isn't able to do is, is that people don't need a lot of in-depth training to be able to do it. They just need a chance to try to explore their, their emotions and their ideas. And so when you're making art, it's uh, a, an opportunity to, to sort of put something that is maybe in the back of your mind or hidden or secret that you're afraid to say into your artwork. And that also applies to what you were mentioning a little earlier, or asking me the question. Uh, I was talking to you a little bit earlier today about this. Music, I think, is one of the most direct into the emotion kinds of art forms that I know of. And, it's, and the only reason I never went into music is I'm not skilled enough to do it. But it would otherwise be really my go-to uh, method of really expressing emotion. And, uh, we have a nephew that is in Chicago. He's in the south side of Chicago putting together a brand new, trying to, trying to get funding for a community art center for at-risk at youth. And uh, my wife and I are putting a lot into that, uh, trying to help him get that going. One of the things that he does is that he puts, um, he puts a very big emphasis on local musicians coming in, creating sort of a, a music event and then during that time people have a chance to uh, come in and, and maybe collaborate and make music together and then they lead into making fine art etc but music is one of those things that you can do if you have nothing else you can sing you can sing on your own you can you can drum on on a chair you don't need to buy expensive art materials to do that excellent Michelle any input on so the question was how do the other forms of art and challenge, you know, your views on the visual? Um, it's very, very much interconnected. Um, when I paint, I listen to music. Uh, I, I have live painting groups where we have dance and live music together. And it's uh, actually, it takes me back to uh, when I was young. I jo joined the um, uh, Art Institute of Chicago. I was 11 and I was doing Saturday classes uh, for figure drawing. And I was one of the youngest in the, in the class, and um, my mother used to take me on the bus uh, every Saturday to go to the class. And I remember one year, or one Saturday, there was a um, um, cellist, a lady cellist, who was in the center, and it was in the round, so we got to sit around um, and paint and draw. And there was a cellist who was playing, and instead of just sitting still, she was actually moving, and we were to draw what we were hearing and seeing and feeling, and that was my first um, encounter with the with music and other forms of art together so it's it's it enhances the experience for sure I'll need to add something to that <laughs> so um, <clears throat> right music painting um, architecture interior design the upholstery in your car um, what an airplane feels like what an airport feels like it all matters it's kind of a whole big package, um, and art's a component of that. And I don't think that you have to be an artist or even be creative to feel the difference. It's really about how it makes somebody feel. So a jail cell feels different than a beautiful five-star um, hotel lobby, doesn't it? <laughs> right? 
Southwest feels different than First Class and United or whatever. So, um, you know, working in architecture and interior design, working with landscape architects, all all of those. And I also listen to a lot of music while I'm while I'm doing whatever that I'm doing. So I, I just think that it's a um, a continual job for all of us to keep raising the bar of um, the environments that we live in. I personally have been on the City of Napa Planning Commission for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, and we didn't even have any design guidelines. We didn't have public art ordinance. I mean, they just approve anything. And so now everybody wants to build a Napa is all nervous, and they're like, well, would this be okay? Would that be okay? And you know, everybody thought I was being a real, well, whatever. Um, <clears throat> but now I can look around my city and I can see that the quality has gone up and the consciousness of the leadership has gone up. Even if they don't understand it, they don't have to. They have a different job. But they have to, everybody has to have the right, that kind of attitude. I just think it's huge. Thank you. Caitlin, I'm curious, um, at SAY, do you have other programs other than visual arts, like music and... I have perhaps the best story about the ukulele. Um, <laughs> so this guy called us like two years ago and he was like, I really like ukuleles. Can I come to Shemaya Village, our affordable housing program, and give all of the 25 youth who live there a ukulele? And we were like, okay, <laughs> cool. Um, I mean, like, that's not an everyday sort of request, but, uh, but he was into ukuleles and he wanted to share the love and we thought, you know, we might have some kids who are into it. We, we definitely have kids who love music. And so he came and we actually paired it with what we call birthday cake night. Uh, another volunteer who called us and said, I bet the kids who live there don't get to have their birthdays celebrated because they don't have parents who are making them birthday cakes. So she wanted to bake a cake every month and bring it so that our kids who had birthdays that month could celebrate. And so we paired those two together and had a birthday cake and ukulele party. And it's been happening every month for the last two years. Uh, and, and our donor, Brett, he, he said there's something really special about ukulele because when you walk into a room with a guitar, people expect you to perform. But the ukulele is small and it's sort of casual. So there's no, like, you don't have to be good at it in order to enjoy it. And so he brings sheet music every month and he brings ukuleles for any of the kids who have moved in who don't have one. And um, they hang out for two hours, eat cake, and play the ukulele and sing. It's great. Are outside people allowed to join? <laughs> Sounds like a fun night to me. I, I was just going to add one more uh, art form, which is extremely important for people who are at risk, but maybe a different kind of at risk than what you guys have been describing, and that's theater. Because, uh, you know, the Art Quest program, we saw some amazing things last night. Um, they did, I did their last show. A bunch of uh, my students have come from the Art Quest program. Theater is a place where people, uh, maybe people who have uh, gender, gender identity issues or they're gay, lesbian, they have a place to go where they feel safe and they can express themselves that way. And so that, uh, that may be something, you know, most of the kids are not out of, uh, out of the home or, or lost in that way, but they, they don't have, they don't have uh, support at home, maybe. And so that's a very significant thing for a, a large population right now. In fact, I think um, the ArtQuest program has, there are hundreds of students that go and, and attend classes there, and they're really raising the bar for acceptance throughout the entire school district. Uh, Caitlin, I'm curious, this is a little bit off topic, but I'm curious, what is the average um, amount of time that, that your youth stay in, in your housing? That's a great question. So um, on average, it's about a year and a half. We've seen that timeline grow as housing has been harder to find. So it used to be maybe more like 13, 14 months. Now it's closer to 18 months. Thank you. Uh, you can keep the mic. <laughs> Caitlin, my next question. I'm just going to guide it towards you and then we'll open the discussion. But um, Ken, do you feel that uh, opportunities um, 
can opportunities for creative exploration help develop workplace skills and either, you know, send people out to the workforce with better yeah. aptitude? That's a great question. I mean, I think these two are perfect examples of how that worked out in reality. Um, for our young people, a lot of them are kind of coming to us with no real ideas of what they're interested in and what they want to do. So our goal is really to expose them to as many opportunities as possible and then kind of see what sticks. Um, a lot of our young people are coming from economic backgrounds where they're looking for really practical applications for work. So a lot of certificate programs, um, medical field stuff, and, and, and that makes sense for them, but at the same time having art in their lives in at least some way, even if it's not a professional way, is hugely important. Yeah, um, at the junior college we have a lot of students coming that are not art majors but they find that having a chance to be uh, not just expressive, but, but learn how to do problem solving on their own, that's really the biggest deal there. And so they may go into a completely different area. In fact, I expect most people that attend junior college's art department will not become artists, but what they'll do is have, they'll have an appreciation for visual concepts, like what you were mentioning, that the beauty of things around them, but they also have, the, at least this is what I try to do in my, my 3D design class and sculpture class, is to teach them how to figure things out for themselves. Let them leave the class with a, an ability to look at something, decide how, maybe how it's put together, what kind of material it is, uh, what it's for, and see if they can prove that. So um, I think it's really valuable to take a creative process class, like, like any of the art classes that we're offering, not to become an artist, like you were saying, but to become a better person in society. And I think there's something seriously wrong with our, uh, our governmental perspective of the value of art in school. Um, the junior college right now, it, you know, our, our area is not, you know, you know the STEM program. Well, uh, there's an attempt to switch that to STEAM, where the A is art. And I think that's extremely important to do. Because uh, art is, it's like the key, it's like the earliest version of mass communication in some way. And so what we, if you look around you, you, you you're the experts at this too. Um, visually, the world is made in either ugly ways or beautiful ways. And you're working to make things more uh, pleasant, more uh, functional, etc. You got to learn that somewhere. You don't just get it from taking the basic science classes, English, history, etc. Um, yeah, I do find it very um, um, helpful to have a creative background in learning skills in the workplace. I mean, we use, we're, we're taught in school to use the left side of our brain, which is analytical um, when it comes to problem solving. And I think that there's such a emphasis on using that side of our brain and we need to have a balance and um, having the learning the skills to use more of the abstract side the right side of your brain helps with communication it helps um, it helps with a lot of skills a lot of people say well I can't draw and I can't paint or sing or dance but everybody's creative everybody says to me you know like wow you're so lucky you were born creative and I said we're all born creative um, when you parent when you cook when you get dressed when you're interacting with your friends when you decorate your home um, you're being creative and we should always um, try to enhance that because it helps us raise our consciousness and have a more human connection so I think that it's ultra valuable yeah, I'm not <clears throat> really sure what to add or if I'm even qualified that I'm going to say it. And I don't know. I To me, it's just really about passion and um, vision, picturing what I'd be telling those kids, the kids that I work with from time to time is, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? And it, if art's the path, that's great. If art, art can help you along the way, that's great. But it doesn't have to be that. And I just try to use my life as an example for those kids that if I can do, if I can be making really expensive things that nobody needs all over the world, um, <coughs> with no, with no for, with no formal education, what do you think you can do, right? And so, um, but it's sometimes a little bit um, frustrating and discouraging sometimes working 
with these kids, even the ones that are not at risk, uh, actually in some ways we're all at risk in one way or another, but um, there's the California College of Art in Oakland, you know, and they have a glass program there, and Clifford Rainey is the professor over there, and we're really good friends, and um, every once in a while he'll send a student up or the um, a senior class and give them a tour, and I don't know what I'm supposed to tell them, but yeah, you can too, but then I'll sit them in my office and say, so um, what are you going to do? You're going to be out of school here next month. Um, I'm going to have a show. And that's it, you know? So there's like, where's the, where's the juice? Where's the passion? Where's the picturing where you want to go? And um, either you, you, if you don't have it, you need to get it. And if you're not going to get it, you're not going to go anywhere anyways. I mean, I don't mean to be so pessimistic, but that's just kind of how, how, how I see that or it's been my experiences. Observing myself and the world around me. I don't know if that's helpful at all to the discussion, honestly, but. <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to add to that, um, you know, because the question is, can the opportunities for creative exploration help develop workplace skills? Like, I was, ne I was not born with the sports gene at all. Um, I am, you know, somehow I did get a balance of left and right brain, thank God. Um, but a huge argument in developing people for work workplace is that's why you're on team sports, <clears throat> you know, to 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 be able to work on a team at when, when you get into the workplace, to be able to, you know, take guidance, to to know your coach or manager, respect them, and all of that. I. Um, so I, I, I just find your comments for really interesting the way it ties in with art versus sports and how the two at a very young age can affect the way we live into our adult lives. Just gonna mention something that I had read a while back about uh, how people in a workforce environment uh, work on problem solving. And one of the things was uh, they, they broke this, these, uh, these, these teams into different groups that that were either given the incentive of giving them a bonus if they solved the problem well, or they were given uh, the satisfaction of creating some nice solution. And it turns out that the people who were given the bonus did worse. And it has a lot to do with the, f the fact that they're, that's what their motivation is. Their motivation is this other thing. Yeah, and so when, they're given, when people are given an environment of uh, acceptance in just enjoying the problem and enjoying the solution, they do a better job being creative. And uh, that's, that is really, I think, uh, the, the students that get into classes where that is the kind of uh, experience that they have, they leave feeling as though they have, they're capable of something. They're, they're capable of enjoying themselves and, uh, and trying to make something in their lives, whatever that may be. And they could become a banker, it doesn't matter. We had, a, um, we had a group of high school students who were taking Woodshop call us last year, their, their teacher called us, and they were at Rancho Catani High School, and they had done a survey about, like, what do you want to make next year in Woodshop, and they said, we're really tired of making cutting boards for our parents. We want to make uh, something for the community. And like that motivation to give their skills and apply them elsewhere and give them to somebody else is really motivating for young people. And so uh, their teacher called us and said, you know, you guys are building a new building. Do you need anything? And he thought we were going to say we needed like a dining room table. And we said, sure, we'll take 63 armoires. <laughs> One for each of our kids. And, and so the, the woodshop students actually designed like this beautiful maple wood uh, armoire and they went through three different iterations of the design and had us come in and look at it each time and um, just they purpose built this piece of furniture for our, our space and uh, they just came for a tour last week and got to see them in, in one of the rooms. It they loved it. They loved it. Yeah. Very cool. Um, well, it takes us to our last question, but I, mean, I love the open discussion. Um, and Michelle, uh, I think this will be really great for everybody, of course. But um, what experience in your life, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, in your life influenced you to pursue a creative career path? 
Um, well, to add on what we were saying earlier, I also think that it's the satisfaction of connection. So when I create a piece of art, and it was even when I was small, I would create a piece of art, and the, you know, I always joke that us artists want our gold star on the refrigerator, our picture on the refrigerator, our gold star on our piece, and that's really what we, what, what our motivation is, is for the acceptance and the the connection of communication. When somebody sees your work and they go, wow, that's great. I really love that. It makes me feel a certain way. And so I was really addicted to that feeling since I was really young. And so I, um, like I said, my parents were not artistic and I looked up um, the art school um, in Chicago and we used to go and um, Part of what they did, which I thought was wonderful, was that they took the students on a tour of the museum, the Art Institute of Chicago, a world-renowned museum, and I'd never been exposed to anything like that before, and I saw Renoir on the terrace, the original, and I was blown away, and I realized the power of, of my artistic voice, that it empowered me to know that I could do, I can possibly do that one day. And um, so I believe that you know art is empowering, and that was my start. You know, it was it was my ticket kind of out of the neighborhood, and it all led from there. You know, I was respected and renowned for being you know among my classmates and teachers for being an artist, and um, I was able to do you know little projects and in um, school, and I won some small awards, and and just kind of built. And I think that that's the um, that's the motivation for me. Just for fun, can you read the question again? <laughs> Just what, uh, what, well, let me read it exactly, but what experience in your life influenced you to pursue a creative career path? I don't know why any of you would be interested in my personal experience, but I'm sitting here and I have a tag and a mic on, so I'm just telling you from what happened to me, so, or how it happened. So when I got out of Juvenile Hall in San Francisco, um, my father was um, living in St. Helena, had remarried this Mexican lady that had six of her own kids and had really long hair and <clears throat> had a real foul mouth and just really just a punk. But I was so um, afraid. I had so much fear. Um, and I did not want to ever find myself in that situation again. And so that was just kind of like reaching out to any kind of rope I could grab onto. And um, so they, with a great lack of enthusiasm, agreed to let me come and live with them in, in San Helena. And I remember pacing the floor at night, and I'm saying, Dad, wow, man, what do people do here at night, you know? Because I was been in San Francisco for the last five, six years. They said, well, they go to bed. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm going to go crazy here. Uh, and so he, I panicked, and then he panicked. and. Um, and so, you know, this is in the 70s when um, terrariums and macrame and sand candles, stained glass, right? Remember that? And so uh, my dad was, you know, he's pretty creative and so he had taken a stained glass class and so he gave me a little pattern um, of a parrot and a box of colored glass and with 10 thumbs I made my first stained glass window and I thought that was the coolest fucking thing that I'd ever seen in my life. I just couldn't believe that it came from, from my head, from my heart, out the end of my fingertips, and I actually crafted and I made something. And so then I made the second window. It wasn't quite as ugly as the first window. Um, it was like, you know, it was all about Victorian in those days and stuff, and Art Nouveau and all that. Remember, my dad was a Renaissance man, so it was all, all like that. And I just fell in love with color and light and form and the idea of crafting it yourself. And um, that's when I made my commitment. It, um, and that, when I think back now, that was 40 years ago. And I've employed hundreds of people over the years. We have an enormous studio. We're doing, we're doing a project, right? And, well, let me back up. And it wasn't, turns out it really wasn't about stained glass. It, and, there's lots of ways to, del to do, deliver light, even with darkness, so if you know what I mean. And so I made a decision later that if I only stuck with 
glass as my medium, then I would so um, limit the opportunities for me as an artist and the things that I could work on. So I just started looking at every project um, for what it was, what story it needed to tell, because a hospital in Maryland is different than an airport in Houston, is um, whatever, right? They're all different and they all have their own stories. So I would kind of start thinking about what the story wanted to be and then, and then let the materials follow and just not even get hung up on if we know how to do that. We'll figure it out. So that's still the same attitude today. We're doing a, um, I don't know how to describe how big it is, but it's just so big. Um, two football fields in length, 30 stories tall on two walls going down the spine of an airport. It's just one part of this installation. It's all made out of fabric. Seven miles of aluminum tubing and five acres of fabric. How do you go from the ugliest stained glass parrot on the universe, you know, to, to that? And so I don't remember the question. I just remember my own, I just remember my own experiences and I'm sharing them with you here. Now, the end. Okay. No, was it a carrot or a parrot? A parrot. Mark, mark, mark. All right, so boredom a and. Position. Absolutely. <laughs> boredom and a stained glass parrot. I remember the macrame. My mom did a lot of macrame in the 70s. And, uh, and the girls were oh, yeah. <laughs> well, my, my sisters, I have eight sisters older than me, and um, they all made art. So I thought women were artists and men weren't. And uh, <laughs> I didn't know until I went into art history that it wasn't true. That it, it is true, but it's not seen that way. But anyway, um, we never got anything uh, like art supplies, like I mentioned before, except for newsprint. My parents wouldn't get coloring books for us or anything like that. They just said, we want you to make your own stuff. So they would give us, my dad would go over to like uh, the newspaper place and get a big extra roll of leftover newsprint and we'd be able to draw on that. Because my father uh, was regional director for GSA's uh, federal building design in the Midwest and uh, that was not paid well. But he believed in government service and he believed in really doing things properly and having really incredible buildings built uh, under budget, uh, best possible materials, things like that. And, um, and he put a lot of people, Congress people, to task about their inefficiency. But anyway, I, I thought I'd be an architect, but my name's Michael, so I thought, hey, really, Michael is Michelangelo, sculptor. And uh, when I was, I was, literally, I was in junior high and I thought, well, I'll be a sculptor, you know? And um, it, it took going quite a, a number of years through school to really learn that I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't know how to make anything. Um, I didn't have any real skills. And uh, I didn't necessarily learn those skills in school either. What I learned was how to be creative. I didn't learn skills. I didn't learn how to use equipment or how to, to design even. And, uh, but now my work is uh, all over the place, um, uh, very, very complex three-dimensional labyrinths that are difficult to describe. But um, I f the purpose of creating the pieces that I do, they're for science centers, uh, some art museums, children's museums, and things like that, where uh, people get to go and just do some escaping. They get to escape, they get to try to put their mind into a task and, uh, and figure something out. It's a lot less about a visual object than it is an interactive one. I never thought I was an artist. <laughs> Um, I went to Santa Rosa High and I had like a million friends in ArtQuest and I always thought they were really good at art and I wasn't and I grew up going to museums and seeing things on the walls and being inspired by them and thinking I was not even ever going to attempt it. And then I worked at a nonprofit and we needed to have a graphic designer so I started learning how to do some of that stuff on my own on YouTube. <laughs> and. Um, and I bought a camera and started taking pictures of everything I could. And I've been a professional photographer for 10 years now, and I love it. Like, it's just the best way to tell a story is a picture. And, and getting to take pictures of our kids doing their work and kind of exploring their challenges is amazing, and I love it. But um, I'm just constantly impressed by artists because I never thought I was one. And then I started getting paid for it. It's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Since you have a question, you want to do some Q&A? Yeah, well, actually, thank you. It's perfect timing for Q&A. Um, 
really going to open it up. D does anybody have a question for any of the panelists or about SAY or, or anything? You have a total of 10 minutes. So somebody better have a question. I have a question. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure if this is working, see. Hi. What? Yeah, it's working. Oh, and I need to be on the video thing for the CEU, so I'll just speak in. T Hi, Dave. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I was ready with a backup question in case nobody else had a question. This is a room full of interior designers, architects, people that work in the profession. We've got contractors here. How can art and creativity, how can we use some of what you've been talking about today in our work and help bring that to our communities? Since I'm holding the mic, I might as well talk. Um, this space is an example of, of uh, and you had mentioned this earlier, about how beautiful it is just to be in here and to feel inspired by the space. Um, having art pieces around, as you do here, it's like, a, it's like you're going through that little corridor over there. That's a lot like going through uh, San Francisco's uh, um, United Terminal, where you have art out on display. That's something that uh, is not really thought too much about in, in architectural spaces. But, but you, if you have the budget for it, that's one of the most difficult things probably, is do you have a budget for being able to uh, put beautiful things and uh, uh, and nice materials into a space. And is it possible for you to be able to, with a small budget, still provide the, uh, instead of white walls, which we were talking about earlier, white walls, instead of white walls and drywall, is there something you can do on a low budget that would be able to provide that kind of uh, environment for people? So I hate low budgets. I bet you guys don't like those either, but that's <laughs> So, um, for, right, well, but for what I do, uh, you know, well, I do fine art as well, but mostly, I, like I said, I was, that I, I do mostly large scale work. And so the way that I look at it is, you know, I'd like to wrap the side of a building or art that starts out in the parking lot and weaves its way and brings you to the front door and then maybe goes around. I, so they're, they're large, it's kind of larger scale thinking, but. The challenge is um, the the better the opportun the the better the client, better the the interior and architectural team, if they have the kind of collective will, and the interest, the commitment to taking their property, their project to a different level, um, and they have the resources to back it up, bang, that's what you need. So. Um, it's funny that you're asking that question because I'd be asking you like, "Where's the opportunities, lady? Come on, let's find find something." But you know, <laughs> because it, it really starts with you. You all you're there sooner, most of the time, right? You're there sooner. Um, the client that we have in Salt Lake City, that airport, probably that two acre, not two acre, two football fields long, blah blah blah. She's the director of an airport. She doesn't really know that much about art, but she feels something about it. She feels something about it, and she committed to herself that she was going to um, have the coolest airport in the country and one of the coolest ways to do it would be um, to hire oh, me, lucky, it's dumb luck, whatever. Um, it's amazing how lucky you get when you work hard, by the way. Um, so um, she was very creative in finding the funding. She calls them different colors of money. She goes, hits up the airlines, she goes, hits up the, um, the vendors, hits up the feds. Um, hits up the city, the county, and next thing you know, she's blowing 10, 12, 15 million dollars on art, integrated into the building, integrated into the experience. So it starts actually with you guys that are in the design professional profession. So find a good client, like this one was here, right? Had some commitment. I'd like to hear from you real quick. How come you put art in here? Really, for real, come on, tell us. <laughs> this is your pre-tour. <laughs> no, well, he he can't talk into that. Oh, he can talk yeah, he talked that. No, really, Sorry, because because right. I mean to Susie. Hold on, to Suzanne's question. I mean, here's a client, so to speak, a client representative. So how come? How do we got a nice building? How come we got art in it? Good question. <laughs> what is my idea? To build <laughs> 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 the amazing thing is we have a board of directors and we're 
know, we have to be responsible for that money. People are watching us all the time, and so you do have to kind of be careful. But at the same time, you have to build something that makes sense. <clears throat> so you know, when I started the tour, I said we wanted to build a building that's flexible. We also wanted one that the employees would enjoy because we really build this for our employees, right. nobody else. So if you're not going to finish the building with art, it really feels kind of sterile. So we moved in the building before it had art, before it had plants. Uh, and so when you start adding all that stuff, that is really what makes the building work. And we didn't spend a lot of money on art relative to the percent of the project. But it was enough. I mean, it's amazing how you can scatter 100 pieces of art out and not even see them anymore in a building this size. Um, but it did come out really nice. I yeah, appreciate yeah. you guys being here. So I, uh, can I just... I don't mean to hide the mic, hog the mic, but real quickly. So that was very key what Floyd said. They built this beautiful space, but it felt sterile. That's one thing that I heard, and I'm, I'm, I've heard that before, and art is one of those tools that you can use to humanize space. Then he said, it's all about the employees. So <clears throat> I'll bet you that they're happier to come to work in this kind of building than other kinds of buildings that are out there. And I'll bet you that they're more productive and they're more efficient with their time and they're willing to work a little longer um, because they like being in the space and they can see that the company is backing them and they're really paying attention to them. So good on you guys. It's like an adult Google campus. <laughs> Um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Michelle. I just wanted to add that if it was up to me, we would have art on every blank wall in the, in the whole country, everywhere. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it just helps um, brand a space also, and it tells your story. So every space is different, every business is different, every interior, you know, who are you and why, and what's your motivation? What, who are you when I walk into a space? And so when I come into here, I have a certain feeling, and if I work here, it'll inspire me. And like you were saying, it inspires, and it also um, has people more motivated in, in working here and wanting to be here. Um, this building has a lot of natural light to it, and I think we have a dismal situation in case anybody wants to come and fix it for us. At the junior college in the art department, we have a very old building, and really it's the lighting. Lighting is the number one thing that really transforms a space. So what we're doing right now is trying to put in all uh, um, uh, color balanced lighting throughout the building. And that's going to turn it into, in fact, it's, it's, it's as though you're walking down a corridor which used to be very depressing. And it's like you have a skylight, like you lift it off the roof. And so that's the simplest, number one tiny thing that could be done to transform a space. Light is hard. Yeah, we, we put skylights in, in our hallways at the Dream Center because it was a really dark hospital building. And um, in, I thought it was kind of haunted when I first went there and I gave tours in October and it was really creepy. But um, we built a lot of light into the campus. We built a lot of um, color into it as well. and. We don't have enough art yet. It's so sterile still. But we're actually working on um, infusing youth into that process. And so we're getting uh, groups of young people who are interested in doing art together with local artists. And we're looking for people to help us with that process. But we want our youth to be able to put their stamp onto the building. And the uh, mosaics that I talked about in the courtyard, that was actually our publicly required art project. And so we took that and then figured out how to pair it with what we do, which is youth. So we paid an artist to work with our kids. And I think that's a really cool um, way to do a thing that the city requires and also like do it creatively. So I would just say like, any way you can look at how to do that more. Gordon, Michelle, Michael, and Caitlin, thank you very, very much. And I'll turn it over to Suzanne.